gotta start these videos with coffee. All right, so now that I've sufficiently fogged up my glasses, we're gonna dive right in and pick up in our series on producing a rock record with Nate Washburn with part two of drum tracking. And I split the drum video into two parts because Nate and I had such a good lengthy conversation and there was just tons of good content in there that I didn't want to cram it all into one video and end up making it something that was just too long to, to watch and too long to digest. So we're gonna pick up and we're gonna talk today about drum tracking and there's a lot of stuff that we covered in this that has to do with you know should you use plugins while you're tracking and what kind of plugins does Nate use while he's tracking a band and you know what is the tracking workflow what does he do when he's tracking what are the kinds of things that you say to a drummer that's maybe not nailing the part while you're working through the song with them and how do you get a really good powerful punchy performance for a rock song without having to rely too heavily on maybe editing tools that could kill the vibe, but then also how do you get the drums to sound big and punchy and powerful without them sounding choked because you're hitting them too hard. We're gonna talk about all those things and it starts right now in this second part of Tracking Drums with Nate Washburn. Yeah, so, so these are the drum sounds super uh super punchy super kind of in your face aggressive um not a ton going on plug-in wise most of the stuff is happening on the uh the console or the outboard gear and then i'll just kind of run through a couple of the little plug-in things i'm doing on the the triggered kick i've got the mcdsp eq which i use a lot of times on drums especially like early in the process i just like to pick an eq stick to that if i need to eq something yeah. i don't like to get into oh i want to use you know this or whatever and so who, whatever eq you're really comfortable with you might just grab that to do little moves i try to do as minimal as possible i try not to uh use a ton of plugins when i'm doing tracking stuff sure. um it's just, to me, it's just like, how do I fix a problem? So doing a tiny little little set of moves here for the... Well, so let's talk about that for a second, because I know that when I was first, when I was first, you know, three-ish, four-ish years ago, I was really starting to track a lot of, a lot of bands. Um, one of the things that I can remember doing was getting, you know, I had the Apollo and I was trying to slap plugins on there to try to compensate for the fact that back in those days I didn't have any outboard gear but then even I can remember every channel of my drums would have like one of the slate virtual mix racks on it because I didn't have EQs and compressors but I but and those plugins were like next to no latency and so yeah. you could uh with the I think I was using like an Apogee Thunderbolt interface and so you could put them on all your drum channels and process and nobody would feel latency through the recording process and the drums could sound a little tighter a little punchier. What I want to know is when you're going to go through and you're producing a song like this with a band, if if at some point when you're getting your sounds before the drummer is doing his whole performance, instead of slapping a plug-in on, if you're feeling like, oh, the kick drum doesn't sound right, or mm, the, the, maybe one of the toms doesn't feel right, are, are you approaching that with what do I have that I can patch in that's outboard gear that may fix my problem, may fix my problem, or um, are you going, I can just fix that later on and it's not that big of a deal. I mean, how are you making that decision? I guess to start off with, with using plugins when you're tracking, I, this is not a blanket statement of, oh, I'm against this. Part of the mentality is that I don't, I don't need to use them. Uh, it, especially if I'm working here, I don't need to use them. This is all the gear I'm really comfortable with. Um, I've got a console to EQ on and the, I can drive the preamp and it sounds great. So that, that plugin stuff you're doing is that, sure, right? Yeah. Like, right. so I don't have to do it because of that reason. Um, that's not to say if I go somewhere and there's no gear last, uh, December, I went to record some drums in a huge ballroom and we brought all like a mobile rig that had no outboard gear, you know, just, just some really standard pre's the, the most the most fancy gear we had was, uh, you know, four API pre's. So, and we had to be super selective on what we were using those on. So, you know, it, that decision just has to be made on what does the musician expect to hear? What do I expect to hear? What do we need to get the performance? Like, I don't, 
I don't think there's a hard rule of like, oh, you should not use plugins when you're tracking or you should use plugins. It's just use what use what you need. You you have an idea of what you want the, the drums to sound like. Chase that idea, but not in a way that's going to be a detriment to like the actual process. Don't don't spend two hours like putting plugins on everything and like carefully EQing. Do that, you know, do that when you're dialing in the drums, but don't do that as as you're listening back or tracking at least for me i wouldn't do that so would you say there's probably a there there's a line there between i'm going to try to process these drum sounds and get them so that the band has this experience that we were talking about earlier of staying in the creative headspace and not worrying about oh is it going to sound like that later and also you could for sure go way way left of that and and be too far in to where you've spent hours and hours trying to get this like really polished drum sound to avoid those kind of comments. If you have a less than optimal situation, like you're not recording in a amazing sounding room with a bunch of really awesome gear, then take a little time, maybe just on your own or with a friend or whatever, and like figure out what, like a quick workflow. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think workflow is the key here. I have a workflow that doesn't include running a bunch of plugins. So that's what I stick to. Sure. Um, and if if your workflow does include that and it and it is efficient and you are like working really quickly and and able to focus on the important stuff, which is the performance of the drums and uh, you know, the feedback from the the band or the other musicians, that's the stuff that needs to be focused on. So if you're whatever your workflow is just dial it in. And so for me, the dialed in workflow is working on the console and the outboard gear, getting the sound of the drums right, and then making little adjustments as I'm tracking the drummer. In this yeah. case, the drummer was me, so I didn't get to do that. Okay, so let's talk about the, there's, there was a little issue with the overheads. I have used 414s as overheads. It's not my absolute favorite thing. I think the snare sounds awesome, and then the cymbals sometimes sound weird. So I had a problem where one of the symbols I grabbed, once again, I wasn't listening to the sound of the symbols in the room. If I was, I would have said, oh, I don't like the sound of that symbol, but I'll play the original uh, symbol sound here. And it's going into the sort of this big, huge, massive quarter note section on the end of the song. So you can kind of hear that symbol. It doesn't sound awful, but especially when I have it turned up a, a decent amount, there's little frequencies that are like little whistle tones and stuff that bother me a lot. And so I ended up grabbing this EQ here, doing some real dumb, ridiculous, like carving out of the stuff that was bothering me. Didn't particularly like how these these moves sounded on the rest of the symbols and the rest of the overhead. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna print that section. Just, that was the one section of the song where I was riding on that symbol. And so I just printed it with the EQ. Is this what will end up in a mix of this song? I don't really know. It, I could automate this stuff. I could do a, a lot of other things, but the solution for me, like I said, efficiency was the key here was Okay, I'll print the EQ. I don't have to think about those little frequencies that are bothering me. So it doesn't sound drastically different, but you can hear it here going into that section. There you go. It's once again, this is not a make or break thing. If I was with the band, I probably wouldn't have done this. I probably would have just, I don't think they would have said anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because even now it's like the volume's pretty low and I don't, I'm not hearing a huge difference between those two. Yeah, it's but, subtle. But when I was editing the drums, I heard it and yeah. I was like, I got I want to fix this. Sure. So sure. yeah, just some little detail. Uh, then also while I was editing the drums, I added a couple little EQs on on the uh, the ambient mics, which I, I always do something. Once again, this probably isn't like the final thing, but I'm I'm trying to hear something, you know. 
I'm trying to hear what's in my head. So like for the front of the kit mic, uh, this is what it sounded like originally. Sounds great. Uh, when, when we're slamming the cymbals a little bit more. Pretty washy. Pretty washy, but even at the volume that we're listening to, I'm hearing the cool tail of the of the room, you know. Um, and that's the, is that the one that I was compressing pretty hard with the distressor? Is that the fat head? Yeah, the two the two mics I EQ'd were fat heads. Um, and yeah, so I just did a little EQ move where I pulled out some mid range, kind of bumped up where I felt like the snare was cracking a little bit, and then you know did just I don't know. This is a typical. This is a typical room mic type move I might do. Sure. Boost a little bit of the like low end while taking out the low mids and then, you know, pulling down the the real subby stuff. And then like doing a a, a big oh well, it's not even that big. It's like maybe where where are okay. they? Yeah, it's like four D B just pulling off some some of the top very top end of the symbols. Kind of the same move. So these are the typical things that you would do to kinda to kind of get the song ready to start tracking other stuff too. But what I want to do is kind of back up for a second and talk about the things that you're doing when you're, you know, if if you were actually producing this song, you played on it, so it's going to be a little bit, you know, you're going to have to think a little bit outside of yourself and what you did. But you got a drummer that's playing on this song. As the producer, what are you doing in the chair to get the take and the performance that you want for this kind of a an aggressive rock song? I'm listening for consistency and and that's what i'm usually that's to me that's what separates like a great drummer from like maybe an okay drummer sure. it's not even like oh they come up with the coolest fills or they come up you know a lot of it is just like do you hit your snare like really consistently do i do i hear like that same big crack on nearly every snare hit that it needs to sound like yeah um and the kick is the same way. Sometimes, like on faster kick sections, the kick just flubs out. So do you find yourself saying those kind of things to drummers sometimes? Like, tell you, you, you yeah. coach them through, like, can you hit that harder? <laughs> I hesitate to bring up stuff that I feel like the drummer can't fix. I want the musician to feel comfortable, even if they're maybe not the greatest musician, and I know that I'm gonna have to fix a thing here or there. But let's assume that the drummer is good. And yeah, we're going through the, the drum part, there may be some little arrangement things I change, like, oh, okay, we have a nice big open first section. What is the bass playing? Are you are you lining up your kicks with what the bass is doing? Is the bass gonna line up to you? Is this going with the vocals? Is Sometimes you don't know all that stuff. So sure. like that kind of goes way back to preparing for the session, you know yeah. what I mean? Having some ideas. A lot of times I'll just have the, the band, I'll just drop in whatever their demo is or whatever their pre-production is so we can reference it. And I can say, well, I don't really think this is the right kick pattern or I don't even think this is the right drum part. But aside from those things, I want them to hit the drums consistently and in a way that's right for the song. If it's a big, aggressive rock song, yeah, just really lay into those things and, and yeah. give me the like, you know, like a musical hard hitting performance. Yeah. Because you know, there is a difference between just I hit the drums as hard as I can and I'm hitting the drums in a musical way. So and that stuff takes, you know, some drummers do that naturally and some don't. And so, yeah, just like coaching the drummer in 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 some direction to try to help them. And I have the benefit of playing a bunch of instruments playing with so many bands and so many musicians over my lifetime and even playing in some like academic like music situations you know like orchestra band that kind yeah. of stuff so i want to just ask you one more question to kind of close this out here is that what do you do when you're pushing a drummer to do these different things that you're talking about and you start to sense that you know maybe you're four or five takes in and he's starting to get really frustrated with where you're at with the song and, and the parts that you're working on. Maybe he just can't get something or maybe he just doesn't feel like it's right or, or you know, there any number of reasons he could be frustrated. Yeah. What, what are you doing as the producer to try to help him get to the finish line? I'll try to approach it in a way that highlights the importance of like getting a good drum sound. Yeah. Um, and, but without, without sort of making the drummer feel bad or whatever, like I might say like, I think this is good enough that I can edit it and it will sound great. 
-hmm. you know, and the drummer might be disappointed that maybe he did, he couldn't nail something or whatever. And we had to like really punch, like punch in a little micro section or whatever. Um, and some drummers are experienced and they get that that's how that goes. Like they're not, not everybody's a studio musician, yeah. you know? Um, but yeah, I, I try to, to frame it as like, Hey, it's really important that we get a good drum sound. And it's also important that we like respect everyone's time. So there's an element of me sort of maybe explaining like we, we need to do this, this, and this to get this song where it needs to be. And that might be something that they're not comfortable with. Maybe we need to drop all the kicks out of a section and they just need to play their hands mm -hmm. and then we will literally overdub the kicks. Maybe that's the way the song gets tracked yeah. and that's the way the song ends up sounding really good, good really great. You know what yeah. I mean? So... And that might be not what they want to hear. I don't want to batter someone's ego and I don't want to make someone feel bad. I just want them to understand like the ultimate goal is that when the finished product comes out is that the drums sound great and yeah. that we're not cutting corners, but we are, we are being respectful of the amount of time it takes to make a whole song and a whole record. You know, we yeah. can't spend an entire day tracking one song on the drums. So if that's like really what it's going to take for this drummer to nail it, maybe because he didn't practice a song a lot, maybe it's got stuff that he doesn't really know how to do correctly, or maybe his chops just aren't there or yeah. whatever. That's the kind of stuff that if you come to the studio and you don't have that prepared, there will be some, there'll be a reality check. So, yeah, yeah. but I always want to be respectful and, and I understand what that's like. So that's kind of how I would approach it and just say like, Hey man, like I really want this song to turn out great. I really want the drums to, to to turn out like incredible, but right now it doesn't seem like that is going to happen just by running a take of the song. Yeah. So we'll take us out by playing a. I want to kind of get people pumped up at the end of this video for what the song is going to sound like. So play us like a maybe a fifteen second section of the song just to round out the video, and uh, that way they can hear some of what we're getting ready to check out with the bass and the guitars against the drums. Mm -hmm. 